Hi, my name is Scott Vandersloos, and this is my unified theory of gravity, magnetism, and electromagnetic radiation. There are many questions out there still as to how magnetism, gravity, and electromagnetic radiation work, and I'm hoping this theory will lead to finding an answer. The foundation for my theory is based on the idea that the physical universe is submerged in a dense ocean of particles. These particles exist everywhere, even in the deep recesses of space where no physical matter is found, and in the space within atoms where no subatomic particles exist. So given their ambient nature, and just for ease of reference, I'll be referring to these particles as ambions. Ambions are much, much smaller than the fundamental components of atoms, and they're responsible for magnetism, gravity, and electromagnetic radiation. These particles, in a sense, act like water molecules but on an infinitely smaller scale and they move and are moved by the motion of subatomic particles such as protons and electrons. So if you can imagine how making a circular motion with your hand underwater would create a whirlpool within the surrounding water molecules, when an electron zips around the nucleus of an atom, it stirs the surrounding ambions into a similar current. This whirlpool of ambions is a magnetic field. When the flow of electrons in multiple atoms becomes aligned, as it does in a permanent magnet, the unified motion creates a much larger whirlpool in the ambions, and thus results in a magnetic field that is large enough to observe. So let's just think about a permanent magnet for a moment. Imagine the electrons within the magnet are aligned and flowing in sync within the magnet. Like our hand underwater, this flow of electrons stirs the surrounding ambions in the same direction. And if you were able to see the ambions, you would notice a rotating sphere around the magnet. When this happens, two vortices are created in the ambion field, one from each pole. If you were to look down upon the magnet and could see the polar vortex, if it were spinning in a clockwise direction and you flip the magnet over, you would notice the opposing vortex would appear to be spinning in a counterclockwise direction. When you take two magnets and move them together, with the north pole of one magnet facing the south pole of another, the magnetic field, or the sphere of ambions around the magnets, are flowing in the same direction. As there is faster motion in the center of the magnets, the vortex from the north pole of one magnet will begin to pull on the vortex from the south pole of the other magnet in an attempt to create a single unified rotating flow, and they will be sucked into each other, pulling the atoms of the magnets with them. This is why the north pole of one magnet is drawn to the south pole of another. If you were to flip one of the magnets over and try to force two like poles together, the sphere of ambions around each magnet would be flowing in opposite directions. This would cause the ambions driven by the magnets to have a head-on collision. This collision would prevent the magnets from coming together, which is why like poles repel each other. This principle applies to all forms of magnetism. For example, in an electromagnet, the electrons are exchanged around a coiled wire, and this movement of the electrons causes a similar rotational flow of ambions. So, if magnetism is the result of subatomic particles, particularly electrons, aligning and creating a unified rotational current in the ambion field, then what is gravity? It has long been thought that gravity and magnetism are two completely separate forces, and I think this has prevented physicists from concluding that they are actually driven by the same fundamental particles, ambions. As I mentioned before, the motion of every subatomic particle within an atom has an effect on the surrounding ambion field. This means that the electrons in atoms of any physical substance are constantly stirring the ambions into smaller vortices, which are basically mini magnetic fields. But because the electron flow is not aligned in substances that we consider non-magnetic, these ambion whirlpools are being created in many different directions. So just imagine deep space where no atoms exist and only the ambion field is present. Without the influence of subatomic motion, the ambions would be still like a placid body of water. Now if a physical object was introduced, let's say an apple for instance, its atoms would send the ambions in and around the apple into a frenzy of motion. Because the atoms in the apple are not aligned as they are in a magnetic material, they face many different directions and their electrons flow accordingly. So, if you could actually see the ambions moving around the apple, you wouldn't see a single unified rotating sphere of them as you would around a magnet. Instead, you would see millions of tiny whirlpools and currents spinning and colliding in different directions. If we were to place another apple nearby, they would have no effect on each other until the movement in the ambion field around one was close enough to interact with the movement of the ambions around the other. 
Since the movement is driven by the atoms within the apple, there is greater motion where more atoms exist, and as a result, the two objects would be brought together at an exponentially faster rate as the multiple vortices and currents in the ambions began to pull on one another. Another way to think of this is to imagine floating underwater in a calm ocean. If you wore a suit covered in thousands of tiny spinning propellers that faced in many different directions, you would notice the water around you spinning and flowing haphazardly. Now, say a friend in the same type of suit joined you. If you were far enough away, the currents created by the two suits would not interact. But, if you got close to your friend, and the currents in the water became entangled, you would find yourself moving toward your friend until you collided. This is how gravity works. Going back to the apples in space, if we introduced a third, more massive object, say, a giant boulder, the two apples would be drawn to the boulder much faster than they would to one another. The extra mass in the boulder means more atoms to drive the motion in the ambions. The more motion in the ambions, the easier it is for smaller objects to be caught in their flow. This is why gravity is relative to the mass of an object, and why objects of greater mass have greater gravitational force. So to recap, the entire universe is blanketed in a dense field of particles called ambions, which are much, much smaller than the fundamental components of atoms. When electrons move in an aligned circular motion, they stir the ambions into large whirlpools, making a noticeable magnetic field. When there is no alignment in the electron movement, ambions are stirred haphazardly based on the multiple directions of atomic motion, and a weaker gravitational field is created. The third component to my theory pertains to electromagnetic radiation. Now, it's currently thought that radio waves, visible light, x-rays, gamma rays, and what have you are caused by packets of energy called photons. Photons are supposedly created when energy is released from an atom. It is said that when an electron moves within an atom from an outer activated orbital to an inner orbital, the energy it loses is given off in the form of a photon. Photons are defined as acting as both waves and particles, and they travel through a vacuum at the speed of light. However, photons don't really exist. But if photons don't exist, you're probably wondering what electromagnetic radiation is made of, and how is it able to act like a wave and a particle while moving from one point to another so quickly. When energy is released from an atom, the same way thought to create a photon, it creates an energized wave within the ambion field. Much like how sound waves propagate through a physical medium, electromagnetic waves propagate through ambions utilizing compression and rarefaction. The waves will travel through the ambions until they meet with physical matter, at which point they will continue to act similar to sound waves by being slowed, absorbed, or reflected, and sometimes this interaction may alter the wavelength. Also like sound waves, electromagnetic waves cancel each other out, and the Doppler effect can be observed with them. Now, holding waves responsible for electromagnetic radiation may be disputed by some due to experimental results that show light acting as a particle as well as a wave, but we need to look at how this is being tested. Remember, ambions and subatomic particles both move and are moved by each other. When we observe what are considered to be individual photon particles, it is a conclusion drawn from an experiment where we see a change in an individual electron. No one has actually seen a photon, we only know it exists by photoelectric reactions. So imagining that ambions are immeasurably smaller than electrons, it would take a good amount of ambions to move a single electron, and the frequency within the electromagnetic wave would have to be just right to provide enough energy capable of causing such a reaction. Given that, a wave that affects millions of ambions may only affect a single electron. For this, the proof is in the pudding. The way we create electromagnetic waves, such as radio waves for instance, is by causing a change in electron motion which results in creating a wave in the ambion field. It wouldn't make sense to say that what we are creating, which is obviously a wave, was a packet of information that has particle properties and carries a frequency all in one, and that rules out the wave-particle duality of a photon. For proof of magnetism being caused by a large rotation driven by vortices in the ambion field, we can turn to the macrocosmic. All planets orbit the sun on the same plane. This means that it is not gravity that binds our solar system, but magnetism. Our sun contains a strong magnetic core, which causes ambions as far as the edge of our planetary system to rotate around it. Every planet in our solar system has a magnetic core of its own that finds its place of equilibrium somewhere in the sea of orbiting ambions. 
The planets align themselves to the equator of this rotating sphere of ambions the same way a smaller magnet aligns itself to the center of a larger magnet when placed side by side with the north pole of one facing the south pole of the other. When we observe black holes in the center of galaxies, these are not supermassive objects as currently theorized. Instead, they are super magnetic objects. A black hole is an extremely powerful supermagnet that causes such a strong rotation in the ambion field that as electromagnetic waves such as light try to propagate through the orbiting ambions, they are sucked into the current and lost or thrown into a different direction. The jets we notice shooting from the top and bottom of black holes are actually caused by the rotating polar vortices in its magnetic field, similar to the vortices that give Earth its northern lights. With this being the case, it's safe to say that spiral galaxies contain magnetic stars, and that the stars rotate around the galactic core caught in the flow of ambions. They speed up the rotation in their immediate vicinity, causing other magnetic objects such as planets to orbit them and form solar systems. The spiral that we're able to observe is actually the central plane in an enormous rotating ambion sphere. So that's the gist of my theory. There's a lot more to this, but I just wanted to get the idea out there in hopes of stirring up some discussion. So any thoughts, comments, please ask away, please express. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, this makes complete sense, but I may be missing something or I may have some facts wrong. So I'd like to know what your thoughts are. Please leave a comment below or send an email to scott at a sober mind .com. Thanks for listening.